algorithms can have an ethics in the sense that they can have consequences that we as humans find unethical or not, yeah. right? Because they're acting in the world. They're kind of a different kind of thing. It's not like a table, right? A table's a table. You do something with it or you don't. Whereas these, things, these computational machines are acting on their own. I don't say they're alive, but they have agency. They're agentic, right? It's like a new kind of thing. I don't think we've had something like this really in human history. We haven't had, we've had a lot of questions of ethics and this and that. I think this is the first time we're dealing with, you know, 20th and 21st century, we're dealing with machines that act in this particular way. I, I see very little attention and I find that really puzzling given that these kinds of systems are going to abuse from everything from who gets hired to who gets flagged as a terrorist. I mean, Facebook is important and I use it as an example because it's visible to people but to be honest it's just one little system in a huge ecology of computational decision making of great consequence and where are the sort of mechanisms for auditing algorithms where are the mechanisms for you know figuring out the way we do with surveys we have we think about error and false positives and false negatives where is that for algorithms there's a lot of things that can be done uh, if a fraction of the resources being used to create these systems were also used to create, how do we do this? And we need to do this. I feel like since we're turning over a lot of agency, we should take a fresh look at what implications are these going to have when there's going to be all this data collected about us and that data is going to be used to make a decision about us. And we might not even know about it. We might not even understand, you know, why was this decision made? Why was I excluded? Why was I included? Uh, very big questions that require multi-level action. That's why I wanted to sort of come to this conference and see what, you know, in Europe there's stronger data protection laws. So that's a beginning. But algorithms are more than the data. They're acting on that data to make decisions. If they're identifying your sexual orientation, or the fact that maybe you're pregnant and they shouldn't hire you, right? If they're identifying such things and they're right and they're discriminating against you, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And if they're wrong, that's a problem too. I mean, it's a double problem either way. So we have to consider, you know, what's their accuracy? Is there a downside if we are correctly identifying, you know, who's gay? Is there a downside to this? And there is in a lot of countries. Uh, I mean, can you imagine Ugandan government having Facebook analysis to filter out who's gay and who's not? It's totally possible. According to published research, you have access to some of their data, you can do pretty good. In the case of Right to Forget, I mean, the implementation isn't the greatest, but I think it's important for people to not have some piece of news from 20 years ago dominate every interaction they have today, you know, because if it was featured in a highly visible website, you can never get it off Google's first page unless you have some mechanism to say this is not a good thing. Again, you know, these are thorny issues and these are not, like, you're not going to have one answer, but there needs to be more intervention by people uh, so that they can protect their own rights as well. You know, Google's right to organize this data and be so valuable is because it has a gatekeeping function. That's why it sells so much ads. And I say, you know, same with Facebook. Sometimes they say, well, why are you picking on us? I'm like, well, it's the same reason you're worth $150 billion. You have a lot of power, right? You don't get to say, leave me alone and then also be that valuable. The reason you're so valuable is that it's a quasi-monopoly. I mean, Google searches like that, Facebook's like that. So they have a lot of, um, centralized gatekeeping function and I think that gives us both a social and like users a moral right to say you can't just operate doing whatever you want. Uh, what gives you the power also gives you the responsibility to consider these uh, larger issues. I'm like all right how do you go from let's help people with autism to let's help advertisers be a lot more effective in government to buy and it's kind of like this huge ethical downhill and the company went through this downhill within a couple of years so this just kind of shows you how things work there's certain things that the scientific community can do and say well we're not going to sell this to government of dubai that's not you know you can do that um, or you can 
you can have the companies have codes of conduct. You can have governments have regulations on what you can be sold using emotional automated detection. You can, I mean, it's a new world, so we have to just start trying. And I'm not saying like any answer you just roll out will be perfect, but you sort of roll it out and you look at it and you tweak it. And then you try to make it better and you try to balance various considerations. But you still have to try and say, if we are going to have machines make such consequential decisions, we need accountability of some sort, auditing of some sort, transparency of some sort. You know, yes, difficult questions. But so is, say, nuclear weapons. They're difficult questions, but we try to do something about it. First thing they could do is give us more ways to signal to them what's important to me. Right now, the fact that it's only likes that I can yeah. signal creates a major problem for any yeah. news that is not happy. So my Facebook feed is people getting married and having babies because they're likable things, right? Yeah. I want to see, uh, it's fine, you know, I want to see those too. And I click on like too, I like those. But I want to be able to say, Facebook, show me things from my friends that aren't all Disneyland, right? I want to see things that are not all happy news. I want to see important things. I have no way of saying this is important, mm -hmm. but I don't like it. Uh, this, this is just one thing, you know, important is a signal that I could have more control over. It could be different algorithmic regimes that organize the news feed, and they could let me choose which one. Right now, they change it. They do whatever they want with it. I have two options. One is chronological. And even that, you, know, you select it, and then they, they change it again. Like You have to keep changing it, and then mobile defaults to it again. Like They push you into their own algorithm. Yeah. And I have very little control. I have, you know, there's a few tweaks you can do. But they're very crude tweaks. And I'm a former programmer. I mean, you can let us tweak. And you, there are lots of ways to deploy that. It's a question of whether it will be an important enough priority for them to put some resources into figuring out how to um, empower people and how to highlight things besides positive things. But Is privacy dead? Of course not. I mean, people will do lots of things. People have always evaded government and state surveillance. And some of the techniques we have can uh, keep people's privacy. And, you know, people do many things. You know, they don't. They go offline. They talk to each other in more coded language. They use encryption. Uh, it's not dead, but it's definitely under a lot of challenge. So it's worth thinking. You know, what do we want to reveal, and what do we not want to reveal, both at an individual level and also collectively as a society. So I wouldn't say it's dead. When I talk to my young students and when I survey them, they're, they're not, like, there's this notion sometimes that they don't care. They do. They care very much. It's just they don't have many good options to try and keep their privacy.